tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Now me, I was a master thief up in, the, in uh, L.A. Like I break in and I done robbed many, many people homes. Jewelry stores, all that, man. But, you know, I don't really do that anymore. Like I'm talking about back in the day now, so, you know, I done... I done, I done changed, man. I done, I done done some changing. Now, let me explain to you now before you get to judging. I was raised by my Uncle Jerome from the age of seven. You know, after my mama died from a cocaine overdose. Now, uh, I never knew who my dad was. Now, old Uncle Rome was one of my only known relatives and my mama older brother. Now, he had been married once and even had, you know, two kids and all that. But his wife left him and took their son and daughter with her, you know, with her. And, uh, you know, back when they was just, uh, man, shoot, I was just a baby back then, man. So I ain't never really get to meet them. And uh, now Uncle Ron, and she left him because he was just a shady character. You know, like he just, Rome never too, told the truth, man. He always was lying. And I think the lie that really just, you know, this according to him, but he be lying so much. I don't even know if he telling the truth or not. But according to him, the, the lie that just sent it all over the edge was one day he came home with some new gold teethers in his mouth. And she was like, boy, where you get them teethers from? <laughs> and he was like, these my tooth. I've been here at this. This my tooth. I done had the tooth. <laughs> so apparently he stole somebody gold teeth and put it in his mouth. Man. And after that, she just get, got tired of the lying and the steving and stuff. So she got up out of there. So my uncle just legit had his own life of crime, man. And his specialty now was robbing folk and selling the stolen items. You know, they call it fencing. That's the that's the term they use on the cop shows and stuff or whatever. You know, but Uncle, he take it down to the pawn shop, man. He had a nice little deal in there and they ain't asked for ID. He just take it down to the pawn shop and get out and, you know, get rid of it. And if it was too hot for the pawn shop, he just sell it on the corner. Now, growing up, he taught me all the tricks of the trade, man. Now, some of the things he taught me were, you know, like really the best thing was be quick, be smooth. You know, don't never rat on nobody. Don't never tell nobody. Don't talk to the 12. I don't care what they do. Don't say nothing to 12. No matter. They put, they tell you, you, you know, you're facing some time. Just tell them you do your time. You know, that's it. And always, you know, case a joint. You know, that means just check the place out and make the plan based on what you already done seen. And, of course, leave no evidence. You know, make sure you got gloves on, masks, you know, watch out for dropping hairs and all that stuff, you know. And most importantly, don't get caught. No matter what you do, don't get caught, so. Now, I committed my first crime with him and I think I was about 16 at the time. And we robbed the house of some rich folks out in Malibu. Now, uh, we really from the South. But, uh, you know, he, uh, he he decided to go out to L.A. Because ain't nobody know him. And he know folk out there had a lot of money, man. So, to him, it was like the land of opportunity, man. Now, the family had gone on vacation somewhere. And we made off, you know, a nice little... Nice little lick, man. You know, we made about 20 grand off that, man. Yeah, boy. Ooh, we, we did. Man, we made about a good 20 stacks up off that. And, you know, me and Unc split that jump right down the middle, man. He always took care of me, man. Now, we had some good times. You know, I had some real good times with Unc, man. Going around, he had this old midnight blue Chevy van, man. Creeper van. But it was nice, though. Like, it... You know, it was a, what you call it, not a, the convert, and he had the conversion van, man, with the, he had the big captain chairs in it, and, and TVs and stuff, but he kept it creepy, though, he kept the windows blacked out, so couldn't nobody see inside that mug, and when we got ready to do a job, you know, he'd take the um, seats and stuff out and all that, 
And we was just riding through, staking the places out we was going to rob and all that. And, man, heck, he even helped me get, you know, helped me get my first uh, couple of women, man. You know, he taught me how to run game up on the girls and stuff back when I was about, you know, 16, 17, man. But, sadly, it all came to an end when I was about 19, man. Uncle Rome and I were at a dinner and just quietly discussing a plan for this job up in Burbank when Uncle just suddenly grabbed on his chest and he fell up out the booth and just fell dead on the floor from a heart attack. Just in a blink of the eye, man, I'm just all alone again, man. Just died up in a restaurant and I gotta tell you, man, it hurt, man. And for a while up after the funeral, you know, I just moped around, you know. We had this little three-bedroom ranch, man. I called that your home for 12 years, man, but I just walked around just depressed, man. But, you know, eventually I pulled myself together and uh, I got, you know, busy doing my uncle business, man. <laughs> I, you know, passed on the family business to me, man, so... I ain't really know how to do nothing else. I wasn't finna go get no job at no dang uh, Burger King or nothing. And I ain't finna go do that. Make minimum wage suit. I'd rather go out and steal. So I ain't gonna lie to you, man. So a few years went by. I got pretty good at robbing places, man. You know, I always follow Uncle advice. And uh, I made a nice little, man, you know, a nice little bankroll, man. But... The thing about that money, man, it ain't never enough, man. And I'm always looking for the next big move, man, next big score. And the next big score came in a news report, and it went something like this. Famous old-time Hollywood director J. Montgomery Gibbs passed away in his Bel Air home yesterday at the ripe old age of 110. J. M. Gibbs started out as an assistant director for Franz Schultz. Another well-known director at Monarch Picture Studios at the age of 21. In 1934, Gibbs, just 24 years old, got his start when Schultz offered him a, uh, suffered a stroke in the middle of shooting the horror film Curse of the Cat Creature. Gibbs took the director's seat and finished the film himself, on time and just under budget. The movie was a big screen success, and it became clear that Fran Schultz Schultz would, uh, wouldn't be able to return. Gibbs was promoted to director and directed his first official film in 1935. It was titled The Thing from the Grave, which won several Academy Awards. Although J.M. Gibbs directed a few films outside of the horror genre throughout the rest of the 30s, his main draw was the horror films that he wrote and directed himself. Officially settling on horror and suspense films in 1940, kicking off with The Vampires, which introduced Hollywood starlet Madeline Chalmers into the title role. Many of Hollywood's greatest stars either starred in or got their big break in Gibbs's films. J. Montgomery's last film was the 1989 horror classic Blood Moon which starred Bruce Campbell, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Sidney Poitier, as well as appearing uh, appearances by a young Ben Stiller. The spokesperson for the Gibbs estate uh, stated this morning that funeral arrangements are being made and details will soon follow. Despite being divorced three times, J.M. Gibbs left behind an estate that included original posters and other memorabilia from the films worth over $400 million. He is survived by two sons, five grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. Now, when I heard all that, only two things went off in my mind. <laughs> One was, man, that got old, boy, 110, that's a long time to be alive, boy. And the second thing was, man, J.M. must... Got a lot of valuable stuff just laying around, man. With a van load of stuff, man, I could probably retire and live a lap of luxury in a French Riviera. In a French, how you say it? French Riviera. <laughs> Ooh, I can live good off of that. I go get me some Versace. Sue. I remember, man, one time I had on some Versace, and that girl gonna come hate, talking about, you can't even spell Versace. I said, yes, I can. 
F. O. Sachis. I'm gonna be looking good, man. I ain't worried about none of that stuff they talking about. So I googled the address, man, and I went and took a little drive by in my Cadillac, man. Now, one thing my uncle taught me about casing a place is to use a different vehicle than the one that you plan to use when you do a job. You know, Unc, man, he bought a brand new Cadillac like shortly after the last little job we did. So, it's a lot of sentimental value in it, man. So, I drove by the mansion just to get a little feel for the place. Nice Spanish colonial revival mansion. Surrounded by a fence about seven, eight feet high. You know, I ain't see no camera or security guards. But I learned there was a caretaker there that watched over the place during the day. But left around 10 at night after locking up. So I made a plan and my plan was simple. You know, I just posed as a guy from the auction house. So the caretaker would let me in. I had a friend of mine that could print up fake documents that looked legit. And a week later, I made my way to the Gibbs mansion. You know, just uh, around about 9.30. And I pulled up in the van and the caretaker was getting ready to leave. May I help you? He asked. Yeah, it's on with the Pacific Auction House. And, you know, I came. I'm just coming. I'm I'm smooth <laughs> with it now, you know. I said, I'm here to pick up a few things. I said, and I showed him the paperwork while I said it. He looked at me kind of funny and said, I was told that somebody from the auction house was coming tomorrow afternoon. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm just here for the small stuff. The guys coming tomorrow, they'd be getting all the big stuff. You know, I don't want to hurt my, hurt my back or anything. I just came out to get a couple of little smaller things that I can fit with me now. Caretaker looked at my paperwork again and handed it back to me. Uh, look, man, go on in. There's a spare key under the mat. And whatever you do, please just take what's been tagged. Mr. Gibbs was um very protective of certain possessions of his, man. I said, hey, man, don't worry. I'm a professional. Now, if it's not tagged, I'll just leave it. The caretaker nodded and let me in. But he got up in his, um, right before he got up in his pickup truck, he reminded me to padlock the gate. I told him I would, and I drove on in. Now, when I got in, I got to admit, this place was fancy, bro. <laughs> like, I was in a wood paneled hall with marble floors and Queen Anne chandelier. Probably worth a small little fortune right there by itself. And in front of me was a grand staircase, and to my left and right were rooms on each side, man. And I went to the one on the right. And I saw that it was full of all the movie posters and frames and stuff. Yeah. While I shined my flashlight around, I saw posters of the films mentioned in the news reports. And I seen some other ones that won. Now some of these were titles as She-Wolf, The Eyes, The Mummy's Ghost, House of the Dead, The Banshee of Bloodmore Castle, and The, and the Ripper, just to name a few. I remember being just impressed with the artwork on the posters. You know, it ain't like the stuff you've seen in the theaters today. They were old hand-drawn, you know, nothing fancy, just pictures of monsters, you know, too, and the other characters in the movie done in some kind of ink or paint in a solid color background. But these were like vintage originals, though, man, not just cheap copies they make for collectors. Like, we talking about the real deal Holyfield right here. So I had to remind myself while I was there. So I started, um, you know, taking the frame posters down and stocked them on the float. I made several trips to and from the van. And after I put the last posters in the back, I came back and took some other random valuable items from downstairs and then went, you know, upstairs to see what I could take before I headed out. The first room I came to on the second floor was at the top of the stairs. I opened the door and saw what, you know, like, I'm like, bro, this got to be the master bedroom. This must have been where that get, like, the Gibbs guy must have died, man. He had to die right here. This is the perfect room to die here, man. I decided not to spend too much time in there because the room really gave me the creeps, man. All that old creepy looking furniture and stuff all up in there. And after all, the man probably did just die up in here. 
But I saw a ring. It looked like a nice wedding ring, man. The second one was an emerald ring with small diamonds surrounding the emerald. And the other was a silver ring with a sinister-looking skull, man. It had eyes like made out of rubies, man. Now, I was about to enter the room next. Uh, enter the next room through the connecting door. When I seen it open up with a creak. Like, er, er, you know, I know old creaky doors be doing. So I stood there frozen in fear. You know, when I saw what was standing there. It was a tall lady, man. Hourglass figure, though. I'm talking about her body was boom, 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 pl 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 she had some bright white skin, man. And she had this long black dress on, black hair with lips that were like red blood, man. And the worst part was she, like, it, it was, the skin was creepy because I like, I ain't never seen nobody this pale. But then she parted her lips and I seen this chick had fangs, man. And I recognized her right then. It was the lady from the poster in the movie The Vampiress. A vampire, however you say that junk. Only, like, she just wasn't painted in lines, but real flesh and bone, man. So now I screamed and ran back into the hallway. And when I looked to my right, I saw... Man, look. Okay, now I know y'all gonna think this junk sound crazy. But I seen the actual dang mummy monster just shuffling at me, man. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And he had the werewolf from the she from the she wolf thing and the and the pale corpse from the from the zombie or the thing from the grave. And then I looked to the left and I seen a bunch of dang monsters and ghosts and ghouls all from the different movies and stuff. And I started freaking out, man. I tried to run down the stairs and get up out the front door, but I seen just even more monsters and ghosts and stuff down now. All the stuff from the posters just came alive, man. Like that dang Night of the Museum movie, but it's a dang horror creepy museum. You know, I said, this is it, bro. I'm finna die. I started talking to Jesus, man. Lord, please, you just let me out of this one this one time, G. Please, Lord. Oh, my God, Lord. Just let me out of this this one time. I thought I was done for, man. And I heard the voice of an old man shout, hold it. Now, I opened my eyes, and there I saw what I knew must have been J.M. Gibbs himself, man. I mean, who else could it be? Like, I'm like, Gibbs? That's you, big bro? I said, that got to be you, right? And he looked at me and nodded, and he said, the one and only. He then moved closer and said, I see you got my friends, <laughs> my children, as it were. I see you met them, huh? I looked at him and said, aren't you, uh, you know, ain't you, uh, you yeah. know, he said, he cut me off and said, well, dead? <laughs> I am dead. And quite frankly, I should have died 30 years ago, but sometimes the reaper can be a bit slow. With that, he let out a raspy laugh. <laughs> I then asked, man, how are these ghosts and monsters real, man? And he said, well, you know, despite the nature of my job, I was never much of a people person. Heck, I went through three marriages before I even decided that, you know, I just wasn't cut out to be a husband or father, you know. It was my third marriage. It ended in 54, and I decided I should, I just enjoyed being around my creations, my babies, man, but I, you know, I didn't know how to bring them to life without them just being actors in costumes. But that changed in 56 when I filmed in a movie, with that movie Voodoo in Louisiana. While I was there, I met a real voodoo priestess who taught me a spell to bring my creations to life. And all I had to do was just picture whatever monster or ghoul or ghost or demon I was creating and I created the creature in my head and all I had to do was just say a few magic words and <laughs> ta-da now by this point Adam dang near really just peed on myself 
And I'm in this old mansion just surrounded by monsters, ghosts, and ghouls. And I felt like, you know, I was backstage on the episode of Scooby-Doo or something, man. You know, I thought this junk only existed in stories or movies or creepypastas or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to the ghost of a 110-year-old crusty old man who should be in the ground, you know, turning into dust right now. He up here talking to me. Okay, man, um, what you gonna do to me, man? Just tell me, man. Just just get over and tell me what you gonna do. He said, well, that depends. I could have them tell you a part or I could, you know, have them let you live if, if, when he said that if, man, you know, he spit all over me. You know how old folks be spitting when they talk. You put all the stuff you took back where it belongs. So I said, look, man, I understand these your babies and you're 110 and you're a ghost and all that. But look, for real, for real, for real. Let's just, let's just hear me out. Just hear me out. Just let me keep half the, just, just a few of the posters and I bring some on. But look, just let me keep, all right, just one of the posters. What about that ring? Can I keep the ring? You know, can I just keep that and I bring all the rest of the stuff back? Look, man, come on. Uh, you know, let me keep a little something, you know, for my trouble. You know, <laughs> I went through a lot, you know, to get this thing, uh, to set this whole. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I'll get you your stuff. All right, okay, okay, all right, okay. But for real, though, you ain't going to let me just keep one of them rings. And, like, what you going to do with it? You a ghost, so it's just going to go right through your finger, you know. Need to quit being greedy, man. Get to the needy. 